Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. The Chinese regime is hinting at war. From an amphibious landing exercise simulating an invasion across the Taiwan Strait, to increasing benefits for military members, to making changes to a law that gives communist leader Xi Jinping more power to mobilize the country and wage a war. A series of military-related moves by China is raising concerns. Some worry the communist regime is already on track toward preparing the country to invade Taiwan. And it may not stop at Taiwan either. The U.S. report says the regime may quadruple its nuclear weapons stockpile from its current 200 to 700 in 2027 and 1,000 by 2030. We don't know if the regime is seriously trying to mobilize its 1.4 billion people for a military conflict in the near future or if it's just trying to ramp up nationalism and distract the population from current domestic problems. As for other options, given its threats to Taiwan, Beijing could be trying to launch an information war across the strait. That way, the Taiwanese people will submit without the Communist Party firing a single bullet. Regardless of the regime's actual goal, the atmosphere in mainland China is changing. Unverified videos of the Chinese army allegedly deploying weapons have spread like wildfire through Chinese social media platforms, sparking online discussions about Taiwan. What's more, Chinese citizens started panic buying and stocking up on essentials like rice. That's after China's Ministry of Commerce published a notice advising households to stock up on daily necessities in case of emergencies. The notice prompted heated online debate over whether emergencies indicated a potential invasion of Taiwan. The panic buying got so intense, state media later had to clarify that the advice wasn't related to war plans against Taiwan. And along China's coast, authorities in Jiangsu, Shandong and Anhui provinces have started handing out air defense emergency kits to residents. They are also posting informational videos about what to do in the event of an air raid. Many citizens posted about the packages they received on social media. While well, Chinese media outlets reported that compressed biscuits and luncheon meat became the top most searched items on online shopping platforms. Chinese citizens' speculation about war isn't out of the blue. Since the beginning of the year, the regime has taken a series of actions, shifting the country towards what looks like wartime policy. This February, Beijing put a law into effect that for the first time ever explicitly allows its Coast Guard to fire on foreign vessels, meaning vessels that enter waters claimed by the Chinese regime. But that may be disputed by the international community including the South China Sea. And then in October, another string of actions began. First, the regime conducted one of the largest military exercises ever to simulate a land-based invasion of Taiwan. Then news came that the regime had tested a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile designed to evade American nuclear defenses. So, bottom line, all this essentially means China is close to being able to launch a nuclear warhead against any other nation without any warning and there'd be no defense against it. The U.S. military's top officer, General Mark Milley, called it a very significant test. He noted that China's nuclear missile represents a fundamental change in the military balance of power. Also last month, the regime passed a new land border law. In it, Beijing declared it will combat any act that undermines territorial sovereignty and land boundaries. Beijing's new land border law is a serious concern. India's foreign ministry spokesman said China's new law could have implications for conditions in the two countries' shared border areas. The Chinese regime also made some legal changes that essentially give Xi Jinping greater power to mobilize the country for war. The director for a top Chinese think tank wrote that the legal update would help the regime to mobilize its civil and military resources more effectively in order to realize China's reunification. In communist China, the term reunification is linked to a future invasion against Taiwan. That's because Beijing believes the island is part of China and must be reunified with the mainland. That's exactly what many Chinese netizens speculate will happen. Some left comments like, we have to liberate Taiwan, and something huge is coming on social media platform Weibo.
Speaking of Xi Jinping, he's also asking for more groundbreaking weapons to gear up the Chinese military. That's on top of new army equipment ordering regulations. The new rules ask for a comprehensive focus on preparing for war and fighting battles and look to ensure the rapid generation of combat power. He also recently approved granting some benefits for Chinese soldiers, free medical services for their spouses. That takes effect next year. Then comes a handful of moves directly targeting Taiwan. Despite the fact that the island's not under the regime's control, Beijing has already started to make plans to allocate Taiwan's public finances. Chinese media reported that at a so-called National Reunification and Chinese Rejuvenation Seminar, the Communist regime's Taiwan Affairs Office Deputy Director Liu Junquan claimed that after reunification, Taiwan's financial income can totally be used to improve civil life though he didn't mention whose civil life he was referring to. A report published by Georgetown University shows that China's People's Liberation Army, or PLA, has used and is using artificial intelligence to simulate war games, specifically for invasion operations against Taiwan. So what does the U.S. have to say? Despite the tensions, top U.S. military leaders don't seem to believe that war is imminent. U.S. Army General Mark Milley said at last week's Aspen Security Forum that he didn't think the invasion would strike in the near future. But he did add, quote, the Chinese are clearly and unambiguously building the capability to provide those options to the national leadership if they so choose at some point in the future. He also pointed out that there is no question the U.S. has the ability to defend Taiwan. At the same time, Trump-era National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien warns of Chinese mischief on Taiwan by 2024. He says Beijing probably won't do anything during the Beijing Winter Olympics in February, but noted the regime may have concerns that a tough-on-China candidate could win the White House in 2024, like Donald Trump or Mike Pompeo. Because of that, O'Brien warns the window between those two events could pose a dangerous opportunity for Beijing. Asked in an October we town hall about whether he would defend Taiwan against a Chinese attack, President Biden replied, Yes, we have a commitment to do that. But the White House later walked back the comment, saying the U.S. maintains its so-called strategic ambiguity policy. So what exactly is the U.S.'s commitment to Taiwan? To summarize, the U.S. follows something called the One China Policy. As you said, we remain committed to our One China policy. One China policy. Our President Trump agreeing to honor the One China policy. The one China policy has become an incantation. It's like the Lord's Prayer. You simply can't question it. But what exactly is the One China policy? It goes back to over 70 years ago. Mao Zedong is head of the Communist Party. During the Chinese Civil War in the 1940s, the Communist Army led by Mao Zedong defeated the ruling Nationalist Party led by Chiang Kai-shek. Jiang and his government, known as the Republic of China, retreated to the island of Taiwan. In 1971, the United Nations General Assembly formally declared the communist government to be the only legitimate representatives of China and expelled the representatives of nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek from their UN seats. In view of the frenzy and the irrational manners that has been exhibited in this hall, the, re the delegation of the Republic of China has now decided not to take part to any further proceedings of this General Assembly. Nonetheless, Taiwan started moving towards democracy. After ending decades of martial law in the 1980s, the government in Taiwan saw its first peaceful transition of power to another political party in 2000. The island now enjoys the freedoms of speech, press and religion. That's in contrast to the one-party dictatorship that controls communist China. To understand the U.S.'s One China policy, it's important to note that it's not the same thing as the so-called One China principle talked about by the Chinese communist regime. Under that principle, Beijing claims Taiwan as one of its provinces and vows to reunite it with the mainland by force if necessary. We must 
The U.S.'s one-China policy is much longer and more complicated than Beijing's version. It's composed of several key documents and statements issued by different administrations throughout the decades, including the three U.S.-China joint communiques, the Taiwan Relations Act, and the Six Assurances. After President Richard Nixon visited China, the U.S. built formal diplomatic ties with Communist China in 1979. In the joint communique, the U.S. recognizes the government in Beijing as the sole legal government of China. And it acknowledges the Chinese position that there is but one China and Taiwan is part of China. But acknowledgement does not equal endorsement. By only acknowledging the Chinese position, the United States did not adopt as its own. In essence, the U.S. is not recognizing the PRC's claim over Taiwan, nor Taiwan as a sovereign state. U.S. policy has considered Taiwan's status as unsettled. But that's not all. Under the six assurances issued by President Ronald Reagan, the U.S. vows to help make sure Taiwan maintains a sufficient self-defense capability. That's why the U.S. has been selling weapons to the island and helping train Taiwanese soldiers. President Bill Clinton stated in 2000 that any solution to the China-Taiwan problem must have the assent of the people of Taiwan. Different countries have used different language to describe their takes on Beijing's claim over Taiwan. 58 countries say they recognize that Taiwan is part of China. They include Israel, Portugal and South Africa. The UK and Australia use the same word acknowledge. Japan used the phrase understand and respect. Canada used take note of. While 56 other countries, including Germany and Ireland, did not mention Taiwan at all. Last week, Taiwan's intelligence chief said there were discussions happening among top Chinese Communist Party leaders about a possible attack on Dongsha or Pratis Island. That's a tiny atoll in the South China Sea. It's located near Taiwan, and 500 Taiwanese troops are stationed there. Taiwanese officials have described the island as easy to attack but hard to defend. That's also the starting point outlined in a recent war game report by the Center for a New American Security. It began with China using military force to take control of Dongsha. That said, the scenario may not be imminent. Taiwan intelligence chief Chen Ming-tong told lawmakers last week that the attack may not happen during current Taiwanese president Tsai Ing-wen's term. That term ends in 2024. Similarly, a new U.S. report on Chinese military power predicted 2027 as a milestone year. And when China expects to be able to force Taiwan to accept a negotiated surrender. That plus being able to prevent U.S. forces from interfering. As for Beijing's recent war hinting, some say it's more likely a form of political posturing. Political commentator Bi Xing told Radio Free Asia that if there was going to be a war, basically it would be under martial law. But he says the Communist Party is now trying to give public morale a boost and show China hasn't given up on annexing Taiwan. But others see things differently and argue that the U.S. should prepare for the worst. Many people are saying that the full Chinese invasion force wouldn't really be ready until uh, 2025, which is four years away. Um, But we've been surprised so frequently by Russia, China, uh, hypersonic missiles. Uh, We were surprised at 9-11. We were surprised uh, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, So I think the best assumption is that we're going to be surprised again. And so we should be ready uh, for an invasion attempt tomorrow. So why should the U.S. defend Taiwan's safety? And why should Americans care either way? From a military standpoint, Taiwan is a key part of what's called the First Island Chain. That's a string of islands that prevents the Chinese Navy from expanding its power towards the Western Pacific and getting close to U.S. territory. Taiwan is also home to the world's most important semiconductor or microchip producer. The tiny devices are the brains behind our cars, computers and virtually all electronics. So keeping those manufacturers safe is essential for global supply chain stability. But there's more. Taiwan is in microcosm uh, really the dispositive issue of the 21st century. Is totalitarianism going to win 
or is democracy going to win? China expert Bradley Thayer says Taiwan represents an alternative China. China does not have to be ruled by the thuggish Chinese Communist Party. Taiwan offers an alternative government, right? Taiwan demonstrates that China works as a democracy. Americans need to recognize that we would hold out hope that someday that Taiwan would be the future government of China and that at some point the CCP will fall and it will be replaced by a, a democratic government. As long as Taiwan exists, the Chinese Communist Party will see it as a threat. Thayer says Taiwan has shown the world how China could function within the confines of traditional, not communist, Chinese culture. Good evening, I'm Evelyn Lee. I'll be taking it from here because Tiffany is on a conference right now, but we'll be back soon. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan tells Australia that in the Indo-Pacific, the United States will remain a persistent power and that America is not going anywhere. Well, first of all, we are a resident power in the Indo-Pacific, and the United States is not going anywhere, and we're not going anywhere in the Indo-Pacific either. The comment was made on Thursday. On the same day, Chinese Communist Party head Xi Jinping said in a speech that attempts to draw ideological lines or form small circles in the Asia-Pacific region is bound to fail. Xi's remark is widely seen as criticism of partnerships such as AUKUS with Australia, the U.S. and Britain. The partnership would see Australia building nuclear submarines. Australia responded on Friday. Prime Minister Scott Morrison rejected China's apparent criticism. If that means that we'll attract criticism because we decide to get better submarines and that upsets people and they want to have a sledge at me, well, so be it. But what I know is this, a key part of having a free and open Indo-Pacific is working especially with our like-minded partners. The U.S. is reaffirming its commitment to Japan. It comes amid Beijing's continued military pressure in the South and East China Seas. The head of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral John Aquilino, met with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida in Tokyo on Thursday. Aquilino told Kishida he is committed to working with Japan to deliver a free and open Indo-Pacific and peace and stability and prosperity for the region. Japan and the U.S. are part of a strategic alliance known as the Quad. This alliance is often seen as a measure to counter China's increasing aggression in the Indo-Pacific. Aquilino's trip comes on the heels of recent visits from top British and German Navy officials. On Tuesday at a news conference in Tokyo, the chief of Germany's Navy said that a dispatch of German warships in the Indo-Pacific is a show of support for Japan. The frigate arrived in Tokyo last Friday. It's the first German warship to visit Japan in nearly 20 years. New satellite images show that China's third aircraft carrier, which is under construction, could be launching in just three to six months. That's according to an analysis by American think tank Center for Strategic and International Studies. Satellite images show steady construction progress on the Chinese carrier throughout the year. It's currently dubbed Type 003, and it will have more advanced technologies compared to China's two existing aircraft carriers. Estimates show that the Type 003 is more than 1,000 feet in length. It has a displacement of up to 100,000 tons. This matches the class of carriers like that of the U.S. Navy's Gerald R. Ford. Those supercarriers can hold up to 90 aircraft. They use an electromagnetic aircraft launch system rather than traditional steam catapults for launching aircraft. Although the carrier could be launched in the coming months, it will still be years before the Type 003 is commissioned into the Chinese Navy. The latest U.S. Department of Defense assessment estimates it will enter service by 2024. The Chinese Communist Party's cult of personality is brought to a new high. Party leader Xi Jinping was hailed a helmsman and people's leader by Communist Party officials on Friday. That's the language used for China's first communist leader Mao Zedong, who launched China's brutal decade-long cultural revolution. And Mao's ambitious Great Leap Forward starved millions of Chinese people to death. Now Xi Jinping picks up the title for his leadership. Following a four-day closed-door meeting known as the Sixth Plenum, the party passed a so-called historical resolution highlighting its achievements under Xi Jinping and fortifying his core position in the party. 
The resolution did not mention the dark moments of the party's past. It's expected that Xi Jinping will secure an unprecedented third term as party leader next year. Some experts even believe Xi Jinping's goal is to stay in power to the end of his life, like his party predecessors Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. Yet Communist China's pervasive social injustice and a yawning wealth gap threatens the legitimacy of Communist Party rule. Two massive taxi driver strikes within two weeks in a megacity in China's southwest. Thousands of taxis pack the roads, honking, same time, same location. Thousands of taxis honking. Videos released on social media show a river of yellow taxis in southwestern China's Chongqing on Thursday. Taxi drivers on strike, protesting what they say are excessive company charges. The drivers complain the taxi company they work with takes over 70 percent of their gross income, and they have to pay costs out of pocket, leaving them with almost nothing. <laughs> We've been acting on this for some time. We post photos of our gross income to the social media platform WeChat. Those are facts. We have proof that the operating conditions are so bad, and thus we're asking the taxi company to lower their fees. The driver told NTD it's the second strike this month. The first was early November. According to some insiders, after the first strike, the Chongqing municipality worried there could be more strikes, especially during the Communist Party's top officials' meeting earlier this week. So they ordered the taxi company to waive their driver's fees for the first half of November. But the company simply ignored the order. That led to the second strike. While more videos emerged online, Chinese mainstream media remained silent. It's not yet clear whether the regime will punish the company and the taxi drivers. A Danish artist is asking Hong Kong authorities for assurances that he won't be prosecuted under the city's national security law. The sculptor is planning to take his work back to Denmark. It's a statue called Pillar of Shame, which depicts the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. Drew T. Kekar reports. The creator of a statue that commemorates protesters killed during the Tiananmen Square crackdown says he wants immunity from Hong Kong's national security law so that he can take the sculpture back to Denmark. Artist Jens Galschut made the request in an open letter on Friday, saying that his presence in the city was necessary for the operation to relocate the pillar of shame to go well. Galschut said he wanted reassurances that he would not be prosecuted under a sweeping national security law that was imposed by Beijing in 2020. The legislation is aimed at punishing acts of subversion, secession, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces. The 8-meter-tall, 2-ton copper sculpture depicts dozens of torn and twisted bodies and is set to mark China's crackdown in 1989 on pro-democracy protesters in Tiananmen Square. It's been on display at the University of Hong Kong for more than two decades and was loaned by the Danish sculptor to a local civil society group, the Hong Kong Alliance in Support of Patriotic Democratic Movements in China in perpetuity. However, in October, the school asked the group to remove the statue from its premises and set a deadline for it, which expired a month ago. That was all after the alliance had already disbanded weeks before, with some of its members being accused of national security offenses. The university, Hong Kong's security bureau, and the immigration department did not immediately respond to requests for comment. And that's it for today's China in Focus. Thank you for tuning in and have a great weekend.